episode of Making Disciples. My name is Chris Rogers and I'm your host today. Today's podcast is an interview with a young guy who just seems to be captivating lots of people's imaginations right now. If you've listened to this cultural moment, then you will know of John Mark Comer, uh, leads a church in Bridgetown in the US. And he's just a really interesting guy, the way that he talks about discipleship. And I pinned him down, was able to get a uh, some Skype time with him because I just wanted to give him some space to talk about discipleship and spiritual formation. I think the way that he talks about faith is just nice and refreshing. Uh, So friends, I hope you enjoyed this interview with uh, John Mark Comer. If you enjoy the episode, then do like it, do share it, do subscribe for more content on discipleship just like this one. So here we go, Making Disciples interview with John Mark Comer. John Mark Comer, welcome to uh, Making Disciples. You're the pastor of Bridgetown in Portland. You're a massive Star Wars fan, which uh, I absolutely love. Um, I am so pleased to have you. Oh, by the way, uh, if people watching this haven't read uh, God Has a Name, uh, this is an excellent book. Uh, so just to kind of make sure that people are aware that uh, that's around. A uh, little shameless plug there for you. But uh, I'd love to talk to you about apprenticeship. And discipleship, yeah. if that's all right. I heard you speak a little while ago, a couple of years ago, about discipleship. And I, I want to feed you some questions that let you run. Uh, so if I ask the question, what is discipleship and what is it not? Uh, how would you answer that question? Well, I think the first thing I would say is that when people hear that word discipleship, it means different things to different people. It's one of the words, one of the reasons that I prefer the word apprenticeship. But, you know, for some people, discipleship means like one-on-one in-depth Bible study. That's kind of the navigator's model of discipleship. If you know that history. For other people, discipleship means um, mentorship. You meet with an older, wiser follower of Jesus every Thursday morning for coffee, and you go through a book, or you just talk or do life together, whatever. For other people, discipleship means leadership development. So that's the kind of, you know, master plan of evangelism. Jesus had 12 people that he poured into the 12 people, and those Twelve people all became leaders, important to other people, and Paul and Timothy. And um, all three of those, I think, are fantastic things. In-depth Bible study, one-on-one mentorship, and leadership development. But when I say discipleship, I don't really mean any of that, although those might be subcategories. I think those are all great things, but we don't call those discipleship. We call those in-depth Bible study, one-on-one mentorship, and leadership development. All of which are great, all of which are in the New Testament, all of which are for But um, when we say discipleship, or we prefer the language of apprenticeship, just because, for one, disciple is a word that's rarely used outside of the church. It's used basically for Christians and cult members, you know, the the Rajneeshi or whatever. And two, I think we import meanings into it that aren't actually from the New Testament, that are radically disconnected from first century Jewish culture, where disciple, people don't realize that Jesus didn't make up disciples. Jesus wasn't the only one to have disciples. The Pharisees had disciples. John the Baptist had disciples. It wasn't even, it didn't even start in Israel. It started before in Greece with the Greek philosophers, Plato and Socrates and Aristotle, all had disciples or mathetes in Greek. And I honestly think that the English word that does the best job of capturing what a disciple, what a mathetes is, what a usually translated disciple is, is actually apprentice. I think that's, it does it a little bit better because it's this idea of like a student or a learner, but not a student in the sense of like a university student where you go and you read a few books and you take a test at the end and you move on. It was more of like learning from a master, you know, to apprentice under a painter or a plumber or an electrician or a pastor or whatever your craft is, where you would journey with a master to become like him and eventually do what he does. Yeah, I like it. Where have we gone wrong? With discipleship? Yeah. Because everything that you've just talked about, we would say, yeah, we see that in the Gospels. But we look at our church and go, that's not what we've got. Yeah. So where have we gone wrong? I think we've lost a few things. I think, uh, you know, one, in the West, we've created this category where you can be a Christian, but not a disciple of Jesus or an apprentice of Jesus. Almost like apprenticeship for Jesus is for the extra serious, something you do post-salvation. It's almost, you know what I mean, what the second blessing is to the Pentecostal tradition, discipleship is to the wider Protestant tradition. It's like this thing that happens after you, quote, get saved. 
And that, of course, is a radical misreading of Jesus. In the Gospels, you have this literary device from pretty much all four writers where you have the disciples of Jesus, which is not just the 12. People get the, the 12 and the disciples confused. The 12 were the apostles. Jesus had at least hundreds of apprentices, if not more. The 12 were what's kind of his leadership development thing. Yeah. But he had far more disciples or apprentices than the 12. And so you have this category of the disciples of Jesus, and then you have the second category of the crowds. Hmm. And the crowds are all over the map. You know, some of them are friends of Jesus. Others are full-on enemies. You have Pharisees that are in the crowd, like working up a plan to kill him, you know, and all sorts of people in between. And you just never know where they stand. But I think in the church, we've created this third category of Christian where, you know, I don't know what that means in your context, in my context, at least in the more conservative parts of America. That just kind of means somebody who, you know, has a, 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 a vague kind of belief in the Judeo-Christian God, you know, goes to church once in a while and is a semi-moral person. You know, it's really, really, really the bar is set really low for that. And it has more to do with what you believe, you know. So I think we need to get back to there are not two categories. There's, I'm sorry, there's not three categories. There's two. You know, are you in the crowd or are you an apprentice of Jesus? Secondly, I think, you know, in the Protestant Reformation, which did so much good in the West, but one of one of its, I think, false starts that to this day, 500 years later, we are still reeling from is I think it humble opinion here. I think it misread law and grace. I think Luther and his followers misread law and grace. And they read law as all things connected to self-effort or what they would call workspace righteousness, yeah, yeah. any kind of effort on your part. And grace they misread, I think, as unmerited favor, like just God's you know, unconditional love is not language yeah. used in the Bible, but it's language used all the time in the church. And obviously there's different theological persuasions that have different takes here. But I think that law has to do with the Torah, specifically with the commands of Torah, that were, you know, made you right in God's eyes if you were Jewish, if you were yeah. circumcised and you had the right ethnicity and you practiced the right dietary laws. And grace, I think, in the New Testament has to do not just with the unconditional love of God, but I, I think it's more of a synonym for the Holy Spirit. For I think the best definition of grace is the empowering presence of God. It's God in you, giving you the power and capacity to be what God made you to be and do what God made you to do. That's really the only way, the only definition that makes sense. If you just do a word study of grace in the New Testament and fill in unconditional love or unmerited favor, nine times out of 10, it does not even make grammatical sense. Because I think, but if you put in empowering presence, that's a whole other thing. So obviously to say, you know, we're saved not by, you know, self-effort, but instead by the unconditional love of God is very different to, than to say we're saved not by our Jewish ethnicity and the fact that we're circumcised and we don't eat pork, but rather by yeah. the impres- empowering presence of God to enable us to be who he made us to be and yeah. do it. That's a very different gospel, you yeah. know, or a very different reading of it. But I do think right or wrong, I think there's this built in paranoia to the Protestant tradition, a high anxiety level of anything that smacks of self-effort. Yeah. And we confuse effort and earning. Uh, Dallas Willard had this great line, grace is not opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. Yeah. And effort's actually a New Testament word. I mean, Peter says something that no Protestant would ever say today. He says, make, uh, make it your effort to add to your life. You know, um, he has yeah. a beautiful line. And so effort is actually a good thing in the New Testament. Ironically, good works is almost like a dirty word in the Protestant tradition. In the New Testament, yeah. good works are exactly that. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. And you're to do them. So I think the problem is following Jesus is something you do. And there's this long running tradition of passivity in the Protestant church where it's like, hey, it's not about what you do. It's about what Christ has done for you. It's not about self-effort. It's about, you know, just receive, yeah. receive, receive, rather than what the church has historically said is it's a blend of, you know, in the language of the kind of the medieval church, passive and active. There are things that you do and things that you give and things that you receive. It's something to follow Jesus is to do something. And so I think even some of our Protestant theology has really messed us up a bit. Yeah, And the whole point of apprenticeship is that Jesus says, come see, or sometimes translated as come follow. You Mm -hmm. then watch what Jesus is doing. He shows you, he he even introduces, you know, how are we going to solve this, boys? And then he sends us off to do it. And then we come back and reflect. Yep. So apprenticeship is very much 
uh, partnering alongside Jesus, watching him and then doing yeah. it with him. And I, I, I would argue that we've actually turned the church into a school for historians. We, we learn about the historical Jesus. Oh, yeah, I know all about the historical Jesus, but we're not apprenticing to his way of life. Right. And, I, I, you know, we've, we've, we've made Christianity a, an academic exercise rather than a life lived yes. alongside and, I, and with and Jesus. The issue there is, you know, we forget that Jesus was a rabbi as well as a Messiah yeah. and the savior of the world. Yeah. And it's not that he's not the savior. He's not less than that. He's more than that. Yeah. And we've lost Jesus, the teacher and the liberal conservative divide. The liberals kind of got Jesus, the teacher and the conservatives kind of got Jesus, the savior, which yeah. is this tragic kind of, yeah. you know, a divorce breakup kind of thing. And I think we've lost sight of that. I mean, Jesus constantly talked about the way. And I think we forgot that the way of Jesus, which was the earliest name for the church, yeah. before it was even called the church, it was called the way. I think we've lost sight that the way is just that. It is a way of life. It's yeah. not just yeah. a set of ideas that yeah. we believe in our head that we call Bible or theology or history or academia. And it's not just um, a list of do's and don'ts for our mind and our body that we call ethics. It is that, but it's more than that. It's a lifestyle. And apprenticeship to Jesus is about not just learning the Bible and theology and learning to believe what Jesus believes. It is that. But it's also about learning how to live how Jesus lives and not just morally how he lives, but, you know, practically how he lives. These practices that the church is called spiritual disciplines that are all based on the life and teachings of Jesus, yeah. prayer and Sabbath and life in community and simplicity and silence and solitude and celebration and eating yeah. and drinking. And these are practices that are all based on the life of Jesus. So to follow Jesus is to take on his yoke, to take on his way of life and to apprentice under him in learning how to do it. So it is academic. Jesus was a teacher, but it's not just academic. You have to move out of the classroom into day-to-day -day life. Yeah. I don't know if you come across this, but um, Rowan Williams, the old Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote a book called being Disciples, I think. And in it, he says, discipleship to Jesus is apprenticeship to Jesus in the same way that a fisherman sits at a lake watching the lake for two days and then suddenly a kingfisher after two days comes grabs a fish out the water and flies away and uh, watching and waiting and in that one moment you see something that changes everything. Mm -hmm. Being an apprentice of Jesus is to watch Jesus for days on end to read scripture for days and end for that one little moment where you suddenly see something you've never seen before and it all kind of falls into place. And I love the idea love that. of being an apprentice. Uh, being an apprentice is walking with Jesus so closely that in that one moment, he'll say something you don't expect. He'll do something you don't expect and everything changes. Yeah. But we don't want the spiritual discipline of sitting and waiting. We want it today. We want it now. <laughs> I think yes. you know, Dallas Willard beautifully talks about the spiritual disciplines as being the, the, the space that we create to sit and watch Jesus. Yes. Uh, and what we've done is we've made discipleship about learning the historical Jesus without the sitting and waiting and watching for the yes. things that, you know, it may take weeks and then suddenly you see something that you've never seen before and you go, ah, oh, it, it yes. all makes sense. And yes. uh, one of the things that I love to just, push and think about is that very often in the evangelical church discipleship is the activity of the doing the catholic church has the spiritual disciplines which are the, the sitting the waiting the meditating and, and reading on scripture the fasting and actually neither in themselves are discipleship it's only mm. when the two come together that you have real biblical discipleship yes uh and it's and it's all of that you know it's the catholic and the evangelical all together that yes. that's where you find robust biblical discipleship. yeah and that's one of the best things i think happening in the church right now with globalization and the digital age is this beautiful kind of hybridization of bringing these disparate streams of the church back together again now that yeah. we have kind of open access through the internet Mm. to all sorts of other leaders and other yeah. traditions, other resources, you know? Yeah. yeah, I mean, when we talk about apprenticeship, we we kind of, our language for it is we say it's a life organized around three goals. <clears throat> Goal one is to be with Jesus, yeah. or what Jesus called abiding, or prayer, or yeah. Catholic brothers called contemplation, just this baseline of life with God 
goal two is to become like Jesus. So you want to call that spiritual formation or transformation, whatever formation word you want to use, where we're changed from the inside out mm. and we take on the inner heart posture of Jesus, which then leaks out in our mind and our body and our relationship mm. and everything. And then goal three is to do what he did. Like that's the goal of an apprentice, right? Yeah. If you're an apprentice, yeah. you're a plumber. Your goal isn't just to know all about plumbing. It's eventually to be able to plumb a house. So if you apprentice under Jesus, your goal is to be able to do all the stuff that he was on about, preaching the gospel and healing the sick and prophesying and doing justice and living out the kingdom of God. And, of course, a better way to say do what he did is because we're not all first century single Jewish rabbis is, you know, um, to do what he would do if he were me. So if he was female, if he was a stay-at-home parent, yeah. if he was an accountant, if he was a pastor of an Anglican church, if he was an artist, you know, yeah. Yeah. how would he live if he were me? And, you know, what, because we're, none of us are all Jesus. We're just the body. We just are one part of it. But those three goals of be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what he did, that's kind of how we frame it. And I find that whatever language put people put around it, mm. you basically see those three categories. Yeah. So some people might call it intimacy with God or prayer and, you know— character and mission or whatever they might call it or they might say you know with god and you know for the world like people have different language that they wrap around it but basically you see those three categories pop up over and over and over and for some people there's a fourth category of community we just kind of put that as the context in which all three happen you know but yeah i just could not agree more that baseline to your kingfish kingfisher's analogy that baseline is abiding. It's yeah. just life with Jesus and trying to do and to live that way, especially in the day and age of the smartphone and the internet and busyness. And if you have children, yeah. takes spiritual disciplines, you know, takes practices, just like any relationship. My wife and I were raising three kids in the city. We're working. If we want to have any kind of a relationship, we have to build practices into our day and our week and our year that creates space for us just to be together, be present to each other, connect with each other, talk to each other. That's our weekly date night. It's our morning touch point. It's our annual vacation. It's the anniversary. And it's not legalistic. We're not, I'm not earning her love by taking her to brunch tomorrow morning. It's that tomorrow is my day off. And every, every, you know, week on my day off, we go, we go to the same brunch place. We have the, we have a meal together, you know, and it's that it's motivated by love to create space for relationship. Yeah. Otherwise, we just we just turn into like, you know, roommates slash business partners that are just trying to get yeah. stuff done, you know, yeah. and it's a, it's a so, that's no fun for a marriage. And it's no fun if that's your discipleship to Jesus. Yeah. OK, last question, then, before I let you go. Uh, someone in my church, it finds themselves, they hear this analogy of being a crowd member or a disciple, an apprentice, apprentice. And they, they actually the reality is I'm in the crowd. I've never transitioned to being a disciple. Um, and yes, the answer is Mark 8, pick up your cross and follow me if you want to be my disciple. Yes. But what would you say to somebody that says, I want to move from one to the other. But what do I do? How do I make that move? What, what's yeah. the shift? How would you respond to them? Well, I think there has to be a moment of decision. So I think in the New Testament pattern, that moment is baptism. So if you have never been baptized, I think that is step one. You're baptized into discipleship to Jesus. If that's already a part of your religious upbringing or your religious tradition or as a childhood or whatever, then I think you need to curate some kind of a moment of decision that is public and open facing where you go on record. And then I think step one is you join a community. You know what I mean? Whatever that looks like. And that doesn't necessarily just mean you go to church on Sunday, you know, depending on the church. But you need to join a community of apprentices of Jesus. Even if that community is six people that have dinner every Wednesday night, join a community, ideally with some older, wiser people farther down the way who can mentor you in the way of Jesus and get you started. And then you just slowly but surely begin to reorganize your life around be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what he did. Begin with some of the practices of Jesus that Mm. set your life up with before God. It might be as simple as in the morning, take a little time to pray and begin reading scripture. You know what I mean? And then you work up to Sabbath and church and community and simplicity. But you begin to order your life around these practices of Jesus in community with the number one goal you start with is just, all right, how do I become aware of, how do I be with Jesus? How do I become aware of God and connect to God as much as possible, all from the moment I wake up? I mean, literally just begin by waking up in the morning before you get out of bed, before you do anything, 
just give thanks and commit your day to God. Yeah. And then just begin to organize your life to where you try to stay in that pocket um, all through the day, all through the week, and every, let everything else kind of flow out of that place Amazing. of life. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving us uh, some of your time. It's an honor uh, to be it's, I love what you guys are doing. It's great. Uh, bless you, and hopefully we'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you so Cheers. much.